Hello, everyone. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you this month's installment of the E4C webinar series focusing on a tool to measure household water insecurity globally. My name is Jana Aranda, and I am the president of Engineering for Change, and I am pleased to be your moderator for today's webinar. The webinar you're participating in today will be archived on our webinars page and the E4C YouTube channel. Both of the URLs for those areas are listed on this slide. Information on upcoming webinars is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, I invite you to join us in conversation with our dedicated hashtag, hashtag E4C webinars. Now, before we move on to our presenter, I'd like to tell you a bit about E4C. E4C is a knowledge organization, digital platform, and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member. E4C membership is free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential technologies in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to visit our website to learn more and sign up. Now, one uh, thing here to note about the E4C Solutions Library is if you're interested in learning more about tools that enable data collection related to water systems, we invite you to explore our Solutions Library after the webinar. An example of the type of technologies that you'll find is the mWater Explorer mobile app, which allows users to map water sources and sanitation facilities and report functionality, water quality, or sanitary inspection reports using standard forms. The app allows users to test a water source, take a picture of the results, and upload them to an online database for other users to see and reference. The full report in the Solutions Library provides more details about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models related to this particular solution. All the information in the Solutions Library is sourced by E4C's research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. All of this is available to E4C members free of charge. Now, um, we have to take care of a few housekeeping items before we get started. We're going to start with practicing uh, our WebEx platform skills, and I'm going to do this first by asking you where you all are joining us from today. So, in the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, please type in your location. If the chat is not open on your screen, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slides. And I'll also join you here. So I see folks from Chicago. I, I'm here today from Brooklyn. I see folks, let me see, that are uh, putting answers also into the Q&A window. Colorado, um, South Carolina, Yemen, welcome everyone. Pennsylvania, so excited to have you all here. All right. Again, if you do not see the chat window, you should be seeing uh, the icons in the middle of the screen on the bottom there. It's a little chat bubble. Also from India, North Carolina, welcome, welcome, everyone. All right, so you can use the chat window to share remarks during the webinar and share any resources that you might also be familiar with. If you have technical questions or questions specifically for the presenter towards the end of the webinar, please use the Q&A window, which is located below the chat. 
Um, so you can, we can be sure to keep track of those questions. Again, if you don't see the Q&A window, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. All right, and if you have any technical challenges specifically that you want us to address, also feel free to send a private chat to the Engineering for Change admin. If you are listening to the audio broadcast and encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening up WebEx in a different browser. E4C webinars qualify engineers for one professional development hour. To request your PDH, please sign in and go to your member dashboard to access the PDH form, um, and you'll see it on your dashboard link, or you can go directly to the link listed on this slide. So with this, I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Sarah Young is an assistant professor of anthropology and global health at Northwestern University. Methodologically, she draws on her training, <coughs> excuse me, in medical anthropology, international nutrition, and public health to take biocultural approach to understanding how mothers, especially in low-resource settings, hope to preserve their health and that of their families. Most recently, she has led efforts to develop the Household Water Insecurity Experiences Scale, which she'll share with us today, a cross-culturally valid tool to measure household water insecurity. So I'm not going to go too deeply into describing it because that is what she will be doing with you today, and we're very excited to have her join us by video. I'm going to go ahead and turn over control to Sarah. All right, and welcome, Sarah. On we're keen to hear all about the HY. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I um, have to say I'm thrilled to be here and even more thrilled when I can advance. Yes, great. I'm thrilled to be here to discuss um, this metric, this measurement tool that we've come up with. And I would really like to hear from people who are actually doing useful things people on this call, how this would be helpful or how this isn't helpful so that we can make it as useful and, and simple to use as possible. Um, so we're, we have something practical, I think, and represented by this user manual that we're making public. Um, but I wanted to say how much I appreciate engineering for change generally. So I teach a class on water insecurity, and we draw from your references, including this particular article on, on um, successes and failures. And I think it's important to talk about failures much more than we do. So thank you, Engineering for Change. Today in this webinar, I'm not going to talk for the whole time. I really do want to hear from you. I'm going to spend about 25 to 30 minutes answering three questions. Maybe four. The first is what are the links between food insecurity and water insecurity? The second is why is measuring experiences with water important? Uh, the third is how do we measure experiences with water insecurity? And lastly, what will we learn from measuring those experiences? And I think questions three and four will be the most interesting to the, to the group. So let's get started. So the backstory is, and it's always fun to tell these sorts of things that don't go into the peer-reviewed manuscripts and the manuals, is that I'm not trained in water. I have a degree in anthropology, medical anthropology, and public health nutrition. And everything that I do focuses around the first thousand days of life. So I think a lot about women before they're pregnant, during pregnancy, and then their health and that of their children in those first, what's called the first thousand days a year before, two years after delivery. It's really a vital time for the well-being of society. And I, with my nutrition hat on, was thinking about the role of food insecurity, which I think is a concept that's pretty familiar. It's not overt starvation, but not sure when and how and what the meals will be. And in that first thousand days, the consequences of food insecurity hadn't been assessed. And so I had a big grant from the National Institute of Health to quantify those, it, those impacts. <clears throat> we know how to measure food insecurity. It's quite simple. USAID has come up with something called the HFIAS, the Household Food Insecurity Access Scale. And that's nine simple questions. 
where the phrasing is, how often in the last month have you? And they ask about experiences with food. Worried about not having enough to eat, all the way to going for a day and a night without eating. And the responses can be never, which is weighted as zero, or often, which is scored as a three, such that nine items times the maximum of three for the weighting is 27. So anybody's food insecurity can easily be quantified. So with my nutrition hat on, I'm thinking about all the consequences of this exposure to food insecurity. And we're measuring food insecurity at all of these time points in this observational cohort. Uh, and with my nutrition, with my anthropology hat on, I want to make sure that we're asking questions that are relevant and interesting to the people we're working with. So I knew food insecurity was important, but I wanted to make sure I was looking at what people in this community in Western Kenya thought were. So I did something called photo elicitation interviews, which is a fancy way of saying you give people a camera and you ask them to go and take pictures of whatever phenomenon you're interested in. It could be um, sanitation stuff, it could be safety on the way to school. In this case, we did what shapes how you feed your infant. And to my surprise, we got pictures like this, pictures of water back. And I expected failed crops, you know, sick chicken, theft, but the, the number of pictures like this that I got back really surprised me and made me pay attention. And people were saying that they had to choose, so this is a photo that one woman took, that this is water that comes from downstream from a prison, so it's really dirty, and they needed to choose between buying food for their family or buying water. Um, and so I ran to the literature. I had this beautiful study design, if I can say that. A beautiful study design ran to the literature to try to find the the analogous measurement of, of water insecurity. Turns out there's lots of hydrologic indicators of water. Many of you are more familiar with them than I am. We have data on per capita water availability at the level of the state. There's the water poverty index, which is useful if you want to know community assets, but it doesn't get at those individual experiences. And of course, there are plenty of ways of looking at water quality from colony forming units to parts per billion of whatever heavy metal. But what I wasn't finding at the household level was something like the household food insecurity access scale. What I found was the very useful JMP module on drinking source, drinking water source, but of course there are many more things that we do with water than drink it. So we developed a scale from the bottom up to measure water insecurity. And it's, um, it taught us a lot about how water insecurity works in people's lives. And now we can quantify these women's scale, these women's water insecurity, much like we can with the household food insecurity scale. And this is open access, available, anyone can have it. Um, and doing this has taught us that there are far reaching consequences and problems with water, ones that I never saw coming. And this, this is also published in Global Public Health. I'll give you just three examples of, of some of our findings. And the first is that of all of the problems that water insecurity causes, like str the stress and the fear and the worry about not having water um, are, is by far the biggest problem. When we talked about losing sleep and having the, the weight of worrying about water on their mind. In terms of physical health, we would expect problems with sanitation, waterborne disease, even some of the physical um, hardships of carrying water. People talked about um, complications like miscarriage from, from water, but from carrying water. But the one that was the most salient and that I didn't see coming was um, gender-based violence. So women said that not having water in the house was a perfectly okay, in quotes, reason for your husband beating you up. And this woman says, I fear beatings, and if that's what will lead to beatings, I'll make sure my husband at least gets the water, as in receives the water that I have for him, not touches him. Um, nutrition was another consequence. So people talked a lot about uh, reducing their quality and quantity of food. And in this picture that a woman took, she talks about how her children didn't have enough porridge, not because they didn't have the meal, 
for making the porridge, like the, the powder, the flour, but that they didn't have enough water to make more porridge. So that's a, a little insight of what not having enough water can do in Kenya. But if you look at the world, many people are experiencing problems with water. So based on um, satellite data, this is blue water, 4 billion people don't have enough water for at least one month of the year. And in some places, as you can see, as it gets darker, more people, many more months of the year, people don't have enough, there's not enough surface water. And then of course there are problems with water access, like flooding and water quality with pathogens or chemicals contaminated. And it's for these reasons that the World Economic Forum has listed water in, in, in when they cite their global risks, the top, these are the top five, four of these touch on problems with water. So the answer to my first question is what are the links between food and water insecurity is that there are many and therefore measuring them will be a very powerful tool in, in trying to affect change. So let's talk about that. <clears throat> we, um, I think it's a nice moment to reflect on how special we are as on planet Earth for the abundance of water. I mean, a few molecules of water have been identified on Mars. As far as we know, the abundance of water distinguishes us from anywhere else in the universe. And we are full of water. I mean, sitting here, 70% of our body is, is composed of water. And when we came to life, when we floated on water for, for nine months, for, for nine months, drinking is perhaps the most common, that comes to mind is the most obvious thing we do with water. But irrigation, both small scale and large scale, cooking and cleaning up after the cooking, and keeping our grubby little kids clean after we feed them, as well as ourselves, are all really visceral uses of water, but water is also transcendent and it brings spiritual meaning, it brings us together as societies. And previous experiential scales at the household level have been transformative. I mean, the measurement of food insecurity has most often been done using USAID's scale, but there are other flavors of measuring food insecurity and it has changed how we think about policy, it's changed how we prioritize funding, and so I would argue that we need a sister scale to these food insecurity brother scales. And I think that the household water insecurity experiences scale is gonna fulfill that niche. So measuring experiences are going to really provide us relevant and actionable data. So my third question that I will pose and then answer is how, how do we measure experiences with water insecurity? Um, the short answer is very carefully. I'll give you the medium answer. And then if you want the longer answer, there's some papers that we've published that you can look into the statistics on and we'd be happy to have a follow-up call. Um, so I'm presenting this today, but this work is really the product of a group of people across a number of disciplines. So I worked with people in global health and development, clinicians, anthropologists and geographers and statisticians and nutritionists. And engineering is not on here, but I'm married to an engineer. So that sort of counts. De facto engineering has been a part of this. And engineers have been listening and informing what we're doing for, for, for the last couple of years. So this is the protocol. I mean, this is published and available for how we develop this scale. I'll touch on just um, a little bit. There, there are kind of three phases of scale development. And um, I will say scale development is not for the faint of heart. I don't know if any of you have done so, but it's, um, it takes a lot more work than just getting together a couple of questions that you think would be useful. So in the first phase, you develop items and you, you make sure you're asking questions about your topic of interest. From there, you test those questions and implement the scale. And then lastly, you evaluate the scale to see if those items that you're asking are, are getting at what, what you want them to be getting at. So I'll say like two things about item development. The way we did that is we reviewed the literature on household water and security and how it had been measured to date. So you know that there's a site-specific scale for Kenya. 
there's another great one for Ethiopia and another one for Bolivia, the Texas-Mexico border. And so we looked at those and we, um, we developed a definition based on how everyone had been thinking of water insecurity. And then from those site-specific skills, we extracted the ones that we thought would be most salient in a global perspective. Because remember, what we're trying to do is measure water insecurity in an equivalent way across all these sites. So we started with 32 items that we thought had potential at being globally relevant. And they were scored similarly from zero to three for often or always in the last month. Then we pre-tested those questions, made sure that they were translated appropriately in linguistically, but also culturally and contextually. And then we administered those in a similar way as possible across the sites. And in the end, we had 28 sites in 24 countries, maybe 25. And we selected those sites to maximize the heterogeneity. So we wanted to make sure these questions could work in all sorts of, of constellations of, of um, infrastructure and climate and water problem. So flooding, these could work in areas of flooding like Colombia. They could work in urban piped settings like Kathmandu, or, uh, urban Kathmandu, and everywhere in between. So when we added, asked these questions, we would get, so here's 32 items at the top. And they could either be affirmed, which will be shown in gray. They could be never experienced, which is black. Or those experiences could be not applicable in that particular setting. Or in some cases, we will not have asked the questions at all. So I think you can see here, like the, the item care for children or take medications, those have been dropped at this point. You can see this is version 2.0 over here, if you can see my arrow. Um, and you can see that in Lebanon, not surprisingly, a lot of people didn't grow crops or didn't have livestock, so that became not applicable. Taking the data all together, this is not something you should be able to read, but this is me just loving looking at the slide because it represents so much work, so much data, so many experiences of water insecurity. But nobody wants uh, 32 items in a scale if they can have 10 or 12. And so we wanted to shed all of those items that we weren't feeling were, that, well, not feeling, that empirically weren't contributing to our understanding. Um, so we, we reduced the items based both on a lot of statistics from item response theory and classic test theory, as well as from thinking through what made sense and what didn't. So we had a number of meetings across time, and we, after much discussion, dropped items that were not affirmed very often, that weren't universal, that were tangential to the definition of water insecurity. Um, there's a rash statistic called inter-item correlation. They had low inter-item correlation or if they were highly correlated with other items. So in the course of many meetings with site PIs, and you can see there's a, a real range of representation in this meeting, Bangladesh, Ghana, Nigeria, Indonesia, Lebanon, or Beirut, sorry, at Lebanon, uh, my little kids, lots of Skype calls from five time zones. We went from 32 items to 12 items. So, drum roll please, here they are. How often in the last month has anyone in your, you or anyone in your household worried you wouldn't have enough water for all of your household needs? Had your water source be interrupted or limited? Had there not been enough water to wash clothes? And then these other nine more for a total of 12. I'll let you look at those just for a second. So we thought we had the items, um, but did we? And I will skip all of the statistics to show you what we found. Now, in addition to collecting those 32 items about experiences of water insecurity, we also collected data on sociodemographics, the JMP module about food insecurity and perceived stress. And there's no kind of gold standard for measuring water insecurity. It's not like you're measuring uh, something in somebody's blood, you can't pinch them and know if they were water insecure or not. You can't take a piece of hair and know that. 
but we can see how these different experiences triangulate and if they do so in the ways we would expect. So we would expect water insecurity scores to be associ associated with greater stress, with more food insecurity, with time to collect water, and a bunch of other phenomena. And they were. Here's just one example. So um, we asked a question if you had been injured while fetching water, and those people who had been injured scored on average 4.5 points higher than those people who hadn't been injured when they were fetching water. So this is all suggesting that the HY scale is valid. It was also really important for us to know that a seven in Nepal meant a seven in Kenya or a seven in Pakistan so that we could compare experiences of water insecurity globally. And using the, the statistical package M+, plus, that would be the royal we, using that statistical package, it was my postdoc, uh, the Ghanaian man you saw a few slides back, we landed on the fact that indeed these were highly invariant. In other words, that the scores are equivalent across sites. So the scale is now ready for broad implementation and it couldn't have come at a better time. So um, last you know, six months ago, the high UN High Level Panel on Water called for higher resolution data on water. And they talk about not being able to manage what you can't measure and the need for this, this scale, the scale of data. And I mean, USAID is also very interested in measuring water insecurity, as are many other um, NGOs. So I would I hope I've convinced you that the HY scale is a robust way of measuring water insecurity experiences. Easily implemented takes about three minutes to do. Um, so what will we learn from measuring water insecurity? And this is my last question that I will pose and answer. So the first thing that the HY scale will tell us is it will help us to assess prevalence. We'll be able to identify vulnerable populations because water insecurity is often heterogeneous. There's not similar access within a community. Um, I've made a pitch to DHS to include it in their surveys, the demographic health surveys. Um, we'll see if that happens. But very excitingly, uh, UNESCO heard me give a talk at the Royal Geographic Society in November last year and have proposed partnering with um, the HYS Consortium, UNESCO, and then Gallup World Polls. So Gallup Polls do polling um, of many things, but in the last five or six years, they've created this global architecture to measure, to get representative sampling in 140 countries, which is very exciting when you're interested in, in comparison of phenomenon like water insecurity. So we had a launch, a cocktail party launch in, this, in February of this year where they sent their ambassador to discuss how she, on behalf of UNESCO, is really exciting to, to be producing the first global picture of water security at the household level. Um, and I, I think everyone here is familiar with the sustainable development goals and what, what you might not be familiar with is that Gallup World Polls have this precedent of being able to collect data worldwide a couple of year, a couple of years, a couple of rounds, and then that those questions become indicators for the SDGs. So there's precedent for their food insecurity um, questions becoming an indicator, same for financial inclusion, same for indicators of modern slavery. Um, however, it ain't cheap. I don't know if any of you know Cardi B's song money. It takes money. So for three minutes of survey, which is how long Gallup estimates that these questions will take to implement, it's uh, $1.4 million. Um, and but I'm not interested in spending uh, my the rest of my life raising a million dollars every year. We think we need just three years of data for to be in time for the 2023 agenda where the development goals are um, reevaluated or indica new indicators are set. Um, and these modules often become baked into national statistic forms so that, for example, there's an, well, there is an example with food insecurity. So this, these nine items on food insecurity are now part of 
what ev- what 60 countries collect every year on as national indicators. So this Voices of the Hungry Project, they are the metric of food security for the world. And it's based on people's experiences. So we'll know about prevalence and vulnerable populations. We'll also understand what water insecurity, what's causing water insecurity, as well as what are the consequences of water insecurity. So you remember this conceptual framework from when I was first thinking about food insecurity. These pathways um, are likely very salient around the world for water insecurity. We saw them in Kenya that there was a lot going on driven by water insecurity. Uh, And the science on this is wide open. So you've seen now these broader scales on on food insecurity. If you do a a Google search um, of, in quotes, household food insecurity, you'll see something like 16,000 references come up. If you do the same search for household water insecurity, you'll get a measly 180 references, and you know half of those are from our consortium. So this, we're just because we haven't been able to measure it, we're just starting to understand what water insecurity can do, both uh, how how deleterious it is, and that will bring. I think I think thinking about this, well, the role of food insecurity and water insecurity can really bring together the the SDGs on food and the SDGs on water. So just one little peek at some data that we have that we have showing their causal relationship between food and water insecurity. Um, you'll recall we had this observational uh, study in Western Kenya, and by the last three visits, so seven, uh, 15 months postpartum, 18 months, and 21 months postpartum, we had both the food insecurity scale the HFIS in place, as well as a validated water insecurity scale. And so we measured those two exposures concurrently. And you can see at the top, this is a structural equation model of the relationships between food and water insecurity. And what you see at the top is um, scores for food insecurity, and the bottom is water insecurity. And not surprisingly, water insecurity at 15 months drives subsequent water insecurity. But what is like super exciting is that water insecurity is underpinning food insecurity. Um, And that matters a lot because, as I said at the beginning, a lot of institutions and and organizations are prioritizing food insecurity as their primary outcome. Okay, the last thing that HYs will tell us is the impact of interventions. Um, And for that, I'm pleased to say a number of NGOs are we're in discussions with or have already taken up this the HY scale to measure how how the construction of a dam or how construction of wells or how changes in pricing structure of water are impacted by by whatever the intervention is and how that changes water and security. So here's just one little peek at what we're finding. So Oxfam implemented this um, the HY scale in Zambia, and they found that this is at a baseline, so without an intervention, that people who had higher water HY scores, so who were more water insecure, had worse overall health, were self-reported, more of their normal activities were interrupted, and they were less um, resilient to cholera outbreaks. So this scale is, is capturing things in ways that are fairly subtle. And I was just at an American Geographic Society meeting where other people were presenting and who had implemented the HY scale. They were saying the HY scale is predictive of diarrhea and of dengue infections. So all this is to say is that when we want to, by quantifying these experiences with water insecurity, we'll gain tremendous insights into what we consume and what we grow and how we take care of our families and even how we relate as society. And with that, I just want to thank my own research group, who are awesome, um, the HY's analytic team, who did wonderful things to, to make this scale happen, the executive committee, who um, really, we've, it's not always easy to work across disciplines, and we've played together very nicely, despite being from quite different disciplines. And of course, I want to thank our funders 
for making this work happen. So with that, I would be happy to take any questions or clarifications or remind me of questions on water and security we should have asked. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. This is a, a beautiful presentation um, and certainly uh, really insightful. So uh, there's a few questions that have already come up and I encourage folks to enter their questions into the Q&A window. Um, immediately, um, I'm gonna start with one, which is um, comes from one of our listeners who's curious about how populations are chosen of who to survey or how they are accessed. So how are you, how are you conducting those surveys via cell phones, WhatsApp, or direct visits to villages? Uh, by foreigners or local partners, are surveys given verbally or in written formats? So if you can speak to that part of the methodology, uh, that would be insightful. Sure. So the, the protocol for this was all of these surveys were face-to-face, -face, and in some sites, paper, paper forms were used. In other sites, we programmed it into tablets or phones using ODK. That was the o open desk kit. ODK. Yep. Uh, and that was a great way to, well, they both had their strengths. So uh, here's another backstory. When I wrote the grant to do this study, we said we would implement it in six sites around the world, but people got word of what we were doing and were like, oh, yes, let's do this and can, we can do this or let's add it into our clinical trial or let's add it into this PhD dissertation that are already collecting data here. USA had already had something there. So we we were very we were I'm confident that we asked these 32 items in the same way across places in terms of what the the content of the question was. How it was asked was different in that sometimes it was using a tablet, sometimes it was using a paper. It was always local people who were asking the questions. Um, and then people were selected, so, and in most cases we don't have contact data. The contact information was a cross-sectional hit it and quit it kind of survey, where we said like, are you over the age of 16 and are you um, familiar with the water situation in your household? And if people said they weren't, then we didn't ask them. But if they were, then, then we did. Um, and those households themselves that were asked were usually randomly Samples. So we identified communities where there were known problems with water insecurity, and the sampling within those was more or less always random. But in the protocol paper that I showed you that's in BMJ Open, it shows exactly the sampling strategy per site. Thank you for that. And uh, I'm going to build on that question a little bit myself. And for those of you who are interested, um, Sarah referenced ODK, and I put into the chat window uh, a link, uh, we have a mobile data collection series that we hosted back in 2016 on Engineering for Change, hmm. where we actually looked at a variety of platforms and ODK is a, uh, was one of them, Open Data Kit. So um, the link is available there, the recording is available there so that if you're interested in learning more about that particular platform and its applications, um, you can get uh, a sort of demo uh, via, via this recorded webinar. So that's just more for reference. But on that note, or extending from that, um, you mentioned, and uh, by the way, I do love the Cardi B reference. Uh, so, uh, yeah, how expensive the Gallup poll is. Um, it, it's really, it makes good sense. Um, so what, uh, what approaches have, have uh, you considered for democratizing data collection? Um, at the start of the webinar, I mentioned the mWater app um, that kind of decentralizes data collection. And can you speak a little bit to that? If, you know, if this cost is the cost prohibitive to, you know, purchase something like Gallup, what other options are, you know, you considering? Well, it's not really fair to do this, but I would turn that question back to the group because I'm open ah. for this to be implemented widely. I mean, I this is not anything I'm coming from. And I feel like I did the, if I can say hard and slightly <laughs> thing of scale development, like now it gets interesting. I mean, now we get to see these relationships between stress or loss of GDP or time use or opportunity costs or 
diarrhea. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what perceived stress. There are so many mm -hmm. things that we can look at that n now that this scale is out there. So like I beg of everyone to please go ahead and, and implement this and, and implement it widely. Um, and if you do implement it, I beg of you to please use the 12 core items that we've identified so that data can be comparable across, you know, from Texas to Japan. Okay, that's bad. <laughs> from the United States to Japan, <laughs> like keep it at the same level. But, um, and if you want though, if you're interested in agriculture, add the ag questions back in. If you're interested in, in child health, add the like children missing school question back in or washing your kids or um, breastfeeding questions. So, uh, but it, mm -hmm. no, please. So for those uh, individuals who are listening to, to this webinar and uh, do integrate uh, the, the scale into their work, um, the data that they collect where beyond publishing in an academic paper, which frankly, most practitioners don't necessarily end up doing, what, um, what means do they have for providing or just sharing back the data so it can be aggregated more globally? Like what is the preferred pathway? Yeah. So right now we say like, oh, if you want to use this data, like please send us an email and tell us in what context you want to use it. Are you using it to evaluate um, a large study or is this a, tell us how you're using it and, and what kind of population. And then we're just keeping track. I mean, as this okay. grows, and it's growing quickly, we're going to have to think of something better. But we're just keeping track of who's using it, which organizations, what they think they're going to use it for. And then like in six months or eight months or nine months, we'll say like, hey, do you have those data? Do you want any help looking at it? Would you mind sharing them back? No one is obliged to share the data back with us at all. We've done a good job of shepherding those 28 sites into a really robust data set that we're now answering, asking really interesting questions with. Okay. And Good to, the to know. Point, and mm -hmm, about the Gallup Go ahead. Um, endeavor. So I've been really insistent that if we do this, and UNESCO has also been insistent, that if those data are collected, that those would be publicly available data because I could never analyze all of that in my career. I wouldn't want to. I mean, we want to get this out so that people can be asking questions about how water insecurity relates to forestation or urbanization or rainfall or all these other types of, of exposures and consequences that um, we also have data on. So I'm glad for mm -hmm. democratization of data. I would like to promote <laughs> that as much as I can. Fantastic. All right, well, thank, that's a very comprehensive answer. And um, for those of you who are looking at the slides, you will see that uh, Sarah has listed a number of pathways to kind of get in touch with her and hwise.org will give you obviously more information. So one more question has come up that is uh, quite specific regarding um, the development of HWISE, which is, did you take the role or consider the role of microfinancing institutions or MFIs and market systems development into account while developing HWISE? No, I didn't. How should I have done that? What should we have done differently? <laughs> Uh, perhaps this listener can can uh, shed some light on that in the chat. Um, perhaps uh, they're thinking more so if those organizations are tracking data as well. Um, they might have had some insights. I, I don't have the answer for you. I think both of us will be speculating on that particular yeah. question. I mean, in our Kenya site, it, well, in one of our Kenya sites, in SEME, it was implemented by, and um, it's called, a, they're a community-based organization called Pomoja. And so they were familiar with the lay of the land and they had done some microfinancing stuff, but this was a randomly sampled people, not necessarily who had been beneficiaries of a microfinance programming or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd be great to know if microfinance schemes change water security. I think that's a, that would be a really interesting research area. I agree with you entirely. And, uh, I hope for those of you who are listening and uh, seeking uh, perhaps research uh, topics for your investigation that you would take up some of these because I think these are uh, gems, frankly, pearls directly from Dr. Young. So um, the, this question, I'm going to try to unpack this. I hope I'm going to stay true to the, what this listener intended. 
So <clears throat> the direct uh, question is, do you have any plans or procedures for rural and remote areas where water is very hard or has a high minerality, I, I think is what they intended to say. I, I'm going to, uh, let's say, rephrase this or uh, perhaps recontextualize this at, in terms of the measurement uh, approach or HYs, um, did, did that take into account water quality um, as, as part of the insecurity element? Yeah, so that's an important part. And in a lot of, we had an outright question, how often less months do you worry about the quality of your water? That ultimately fell away after a number of st like statistics said it was, it was clustering with others. So if they're highly, if, if four items are highly correlated, then you can have just one and it does the work of, of all four. So that question fell away and but the qu quality is implicit in a number of the 12 items. I don't know, do I have the 12 items? Yeah. So um, if, for example, the gone sleep thirsty because there wasn't any water to drink. Oops. I, I have control now, Sarah, so I'm gonna to get to that slide. Let me know okay. which slide number is oh, it's, it's right at the end. If you just go forward to like the final slide and then it's one more forward. Um, so because you didn't have any water to drink, implicit in that not any water to drink is quality of water. Also changing the, the foods that you cooked. One more, there we go. Um, changing what was eaten because there were problems with water. Like if you couldn't wash the food, if you only had that prison, downstream prison water. Mm -hmm. um, so are usable or drinkable water, in, quality is implicit in those. Understood, there you go. So hopefully that addressed the question uh, for our listener. Um, the other kind of side of that is how does this kind of, um, okay, how can it be applied to transient populations? So, for example, underprivileged communities who are migrating for work and constantly on the move. Um, how does that uh, presented so that it, obviously much of this is, is uh, related to uh, core location, but for transient populations, mm -hmm. how do you account for that? Yeah, so there's a number of populations we're thinking about using this in. So pastoralists in northern Kenya, but also Roma communities in Eastern Europe. Um, that they might be in in movement, but all you need to do is talk to them for a few minutes, depending if you want to collect just water and security, if you want to know other covariates. So as long as they're around and you can move with them, you can ask them these questions. And if I was asking those questions, I would definitely be adding in back in a question that fell out, which was like, are you moving because of problems with water? Right, exactly. So I, I suppose to kind of come back to the users, uh, and you can apply the HYs tools uh, to transient populations. However, it's obviously critical that you report um, and, and frame uh, the results and, and underscore that this is a transient population that has been surveyed. Yeah. So um, there, there's another question here, uh, one that I might take also, but I'm just going to tackle this other one. Do most NGOs work on these issues or are there corporations or entities in the private sector that are investigating water security as well from your experience? What are the NGOs that work on this? No, the question is, uh, so this, this user perceives that you obviously spoke to the multilateral agencies as well as the nonprofits and NGOs that are, uh, would be definitely deploying HYs. Uh -huh. are, are there examples of corporations or private sector entities that are also looking at water security or water insecurity in this instance? Well, aware of? great question, and we're trying to raise a bunch of money, so we're thinking a lot about which corporations <laughs> yeah. would um, care about this. I mean, a number of large companies depend a lot on water, and I think about the beer mm -hmm. industry and the soda industry. Water is used a lot for manufacturing, but it's not as the quality isn't as important. So certainly. Um, these beverage companies care a lot about water. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've also talked to um, some 
like faucet companies who are thinking about water. But if there are other ideas for who in the corporate world that would be interested in this, I'm all ears. Thank you. Good. That's a, that's a hopeful inspiration for those listeners who are in the private sector to consider how this might be part of their uh, strategy. Um, so this uh, another question came in, which uh, I think, uh, like I said, I can tackle. Uh, the question is, where do engineers work or in what context do engineers work to address water security issues at the household and or community level? Seems like people educating global development or global health would definitely work on this. But where would the technical skills of engineers be most useful and impactful? So thank you for asking that question. You've come to that question. You've come to the right place. <laughs> so Sarah, obviously you can feel free to pitch in. But um, on behalf of E4C, I can tell you that engineers are working across the board on these issues uh, from the perspective of research to the development of technologies that address water security. Um, those uh, technologies range from actual devices for uh, water access, but also to monitoring of water systems and water sources. Uh, we have a number of examples uh, in, on our platform, in the solutions library, across our news stories and so forth, um, that highlight uh, the types of technology-based solutions for remote sensing and also for, as I mentioned, data collection. A lot of these platforms that are used to actually collect survey results are built on platforms that engineers have designed, um, computer scientists and so forth. Uh, beyond that, um, engineers are largely crossing over into uh, research areas. Uh, there is um, the Engineering for Global Development a Research Forum that's hosted by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, which is at a, a, their International Design and Engineering Conference annually, attracts a variety of paper submissions where, where this work is reviewed. There are a number of examples of engineers contributing to this field from a variety of di directions, from fundamental research through technology development, through actual implementation of projects, and the building of the infrastructure to address water security issues. Having said that, what I think is particularly compelling relative to what Dr. Young has shared with us today is actually having engineers who are working in these projects consider how they are understanding what is underlying uh, kind of the, the drive for you know, deploying the technology, which is fundamentally the water and security issue. So being able to be part of this global collection and understanding of what water and security looks like around these vulnerable populations is something where engineers can actively contribute. Um, one thing I think we can all agree on is that engineers are pretty good at collecting data. And even better when you give us the right kinds of language <laughs> to ensure we're asking the right question. So um, with that, I, I do want to put out a call there if you are working on these projects, if you are actually listening right now and considering how you might integrate HYs into your uh, work, uh, I think Sarah has given you the right tools and um, the pathways for contributing to this global knowledge base. So please do adopt this tool and, um, you know, really think through where in your projects this would be, uh, there will be an opportunity to measure that water insecurity. I hope that addressed that. I don't know, Sarah, if you want to add anything else to that. No, I mean, you're making me think we should have a minimal like set of information that is collected. If you're going to collect these, you should know like the gender of the person who's responding or maybe where they live. But I, we don't we don't have that laid out, but you're inspiring me. Ah, well, I'm glad to hear that for sure. And uh, we're excited to actively spark and, and motivate you on this webinar. It's an it's additional benefit of the engagement. Um, so I'm just looking through. It looks like we've tackled most of the questions that have come up. If anybody has any burning questions, speak now or forever hold your peace, as they say, because it's, uh, we're, we're also not the types to hold on to our speakers longer than necessary. Um, so I'm seeing no further questions. I think we're going to be uh, going ahead and wrapping up. And with that, I would like to thank Dr. Young for spending time with us.
Um, this has been thoroughly insightful, and uh, as I noted, we believe that this is a really meaningful and necessary tool um, for us to deploy wisely and, uh, of course, to contribute to your findings um, on the global water and security more generally. So with that, I'd like to thank also our attendees. Uh, thank you for joining us from all over the world. Uh, for those of you who are seeking professional development hours, please go ahead and access the link that is on this page to get directions on how to do that. If you have questions that we haven't addressed and, and you're eager to you know, dig out more information, feel free to send us an email or uh, you, know, you would have seen Dr. Young's email address and Twitter handles all listed, so feel free to ping her directly. And of course, we wanna encourage you to join us as members to get information on upcoming webinars. We actually are going to be hosting MWater and they have a new data collection tool that they'll be presenting in a couple of months. So for those of you who are interested in data collection platforms, this may be of interest. And with that, I would like to wish everybody a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you're joining us from today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.